It is my joy to welcome you to today's podcast. Our prayer is that the Lord will minister to you in a special way during our time together. I'm excited to be standing here. I'm excited to be seeing all of you here. Let me ask you a question. What happens when a pastor is excited? Think about it. Offering, okay. What happens when a pastor is excited? Well, you see a rev elation. You can wait and you can set yourself upright for an explosive revelation coming your way. And for all those who did not understand, you can meet me after the service. I'll shed more light on it. All right. This week, or the coming week, or the coming Thursday, the world is going to celebrate Thanksgiving Day. Every fourth Thursday in November is a holiday in the West and is celebrated as a Thanksgiving Day. What do you think of when you think of Thanksgiving? What do you think of when you think of Thanksgiving? Food? Eating? Football? Cricket? Sports? Shopping? Family? Sales? Long weekend? Turkey? Is that all? Thanksgiving is much more than any of these. For God's people, every day ought to be a Thanksgiving day. The title of my message today is A Thankful Heart. And before we go any further, let us bow our heads for a moment and look onto the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, first of all, we want to thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness to each one of us, Lord. Lord, how could we ever, ever repay you for what all that you've done for us, Lord? Lord, we invite you at this place, Lord. We just want to celebrate the work of your Holy Spirit in and through us during what has been an extraordinary time in history, Lord. Lord, I'm grateful for this family. I'm grateful for what you have done in each one of our life, Lord. Lord, we pray that you will be pleased. We pray that you will be pleased at the end of the service. Lord, help us to always point back to you for the things that you've done for us. And thank you for that, Lord. We once again want to thank you. We once again invite you. Holy Spirit, take total control. And in your strong name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanksgiving. It is not much in our culture. It is not in our country. But it is picking up. And let me share a quick history on Thanksgiving Day. Thanksgiving Day is a distinctive holiday. It doesn't commemorate a battle or anyone's birthday. It's simply a day set aside to express our thanks to God. Did you know that in the year 1789, George Washington made a public proclamation saying that it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore or beseech or plead for His protection and favor. He recommended and assigned Thursday the 26th of November, 1789, to be the day of thanksgiving. Of course, most of us do not know the story of the pilgrims, how they and the Indians, I'm talking about the Red Indians of that time, of that area, had a Thanksgiving feast in the year 1621. 
long before Washington's proclamation. Abraham Lincoln, in the year 1863, had declared this day as a day of fasting and praying. However, today, it has become a day of feasting and shopping. Even earlier than 1621, we find people offering up thanks to God. Does the Bible say anything about this? Does the Bible say anything about thanksgiving? In the Old Testament, we find a song of thanksgiving. It is the Psalm 100. It is subtitled, A Psalm of Thanksgiving. It is an invitation to join together to acknowledge the great things that God has done. Not only does Psalm 100 call us to praise the Lord with thanksgiving, but it also describes to us the very nature of thanksgiving. I'm going to give you five words that describes the essence of thanksgiving. And let's look into Psalm 100. The number one word is joy. Verse 1 says, make a joyful shout. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all he lands. You know, when you're watching an IPL match on your television, or when you're in a cricket stadium, there is no problem shouting. And I'm talking about when I look at home with our boys, when Hyderabad, Sunrisers Hyderabad, they play IPL and they, they hit a six, or they take a crucial wicket, or when they win a match, oh boy, there's so much of excitement, there's so much of joy, there's so much of shouting, there's so much of energy. The jubilation and the shouting. However, when it comes to praise and worship during the family time, I somehow don't see the same energy. Two weeks ago, we saw the victory celebration of the US elections. That celebration was a shout of praise. They had won the battle. They had won the elections as per the media. The victory had been won. There was so much of joy. They were cheering for the leader. But let me say this. If you have read this book, and if you have read the last chapter, you know who has won the victory. You know who has won the battle. Our Lord has won the battle for each one of us. He has been victorious. He deserves the praise. Praise be to the God on high. And I need to shout joyfully because my God has won the victory. My God has won the battle. And we need to be filled with joy and shout about it. Number two, gladness. Verse two says that serve the king, serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. And there's a, there's a huge difference between gladness and sadness. We got to come into the presence of the Lord with gladness and not sadness. And lot many times when you look at people, when they come into a Sunday morning service, they come as if they've come for a funeral service. But you got to be coming into a Sunday service as if you're coming for a resurrection service because our Lord, our Savior, has been risen. He is a risen Savior. He is alive. He is in the world today. Our Lord has risen from the dead, and you and I need to celebrate that fact. Because we serve a risen Savior. He is in the world today. I know He's living, no matter what the people say because I hear his voice, the subtle voice. I see his hand of mercy. And at the time that I need him, he's always near. He lives 
Yes, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me. He is with me when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, when I am going through the narrow path in my life, when I go through depression or anxiety or loneliness or fear. He's there with me. And people ask this question, how do you know? He lives. He lives within my heart. Church, when we come before the Lord, we ought to come with gladness. Knowing that he lives, knowing that he is alive, knowing that he is within our hearts. Number three, dependence. Verse three says, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Amplified version says it a little more clear and strong. It says, know, perceive, recognize and understand with approval that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. And we are his we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says that for we are God's handy work, masterpiece, workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance to do to for us to do. Our God is Lord. Our God is creator. Our God is the shepherd. God guides us to the place of security, plenty, which is abundance, and rest. What does Psalms 23 verse 1 till 3 says? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Someone has rightly said this. If we are created, he is the creator. If we are the sheep, he is the shepherd. If we are in his courts, he is the king. If we serve him, he is our master. I am dependent on God. He created even the air that you and I breathe. He knows every hair on my head. He knows every beat of my heart. And I thank God for being my God. And I am dependent on him. Number four. The word is thankfulness. Word says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. You can't give thanks unless you are thankful. Thanksgiving is what flows out of a thankful heart. You know, we read of a beautiful and interesting story in Luke chapter 17, where Jesus heals those 10 lepers. You know, the story here goes about like this, that when Jesus enters the village, and upon entering, he finds 10 men who were lepers. They stood a long way, and they were shouting and screaming and yelling from there, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Master, have pity on us. And Jesus looks unto them. Jesus saw them and he said to them, go show yourself to the priest. Now this showing themselves to the priest was a, was a law that God gave to Moses way back in the Old Testament, way back where, uh, where you can read about it in Levit Leviticus chapter 14, verse 2 until 32, where if someone has to be pronounced clean, they got to go and meet the priest. So I'm not getting into that. But the point here is, he says, go 
and show yourself to the priest. Did you know that they had not been cleansed yet? They left before they were cured because the Bible says as they went along, they were cleansed. Do you know what happened then? One of them, only one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned around. He comes back to Jesus and he falls flat on his face on the feet of Jesus, glorifying God and thanking Jesus for the healing, for the cleansing that he received. Only one came back. Only one returned and thanked Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus asked him? Where there are not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? You think he did not know that they would not return? You think Jesus did not know that they will not come back after getting healed? Then why is he asking this question? Why is he asking this question that were there not ten who got cleansed? Where are the other nine? It is out of the concern and the desire that Jesus is asking that question. Think of the pandemic. The last eight to nine months, we have been through tough times. But if today you and I are sitting here, we have sailed through it and we got to thank God for the same. Amen? You know, you might have heard of this saying, and we hear it a lot in our corporate world, which says that life is not a bed of roses. Life is not a bed of roses. Yeah, you will not get everything on a platter served to you like this. Life is not a bed of roses. Fine. But for us, remember, life may not be a bed of roses, but remember who wore the thorns. Who wore those thorns? Jesus, for you and me. Jesus wore those thorns. Church, we need to be thankful to God for what he has done. Number five, gratitude. Verse five says, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Three reasons to be grateful. Number one, the Lord is good. Number two, the Lord's mercy is everlasting. And number three, the Lord's truth endures forever. Paul, in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, is giving thanks and praise to God when he writes and I'm reading the message translation. It says, everything comes from him, everything happens through him, everything ends up in him. Always glory, always praise. Yes, yes, yes. Our praise, our thanksgiving, our worship needs to be directed to God and God alone. Let God be thanked with joy and gladness, with thankfulness and gratitude, and with a heart dependent on him. Let's move on. Let me ask this. Did Jesus thank God in the Bible? Did Jesus ever thank the Lord? And if yes, how many times did Jesus thank? Four times it is mentioned in the gospel. Four times Jesus said, thank you. And I want to bring simple four different perspectives on thanks and how Jesus thanked God and tied up with a heart of a thankful heart. Number one, Jesus 
thank God for food. Now you can read about Jesus feeding the 5,000 in John chapter 6, words 5 until 11. Now verse 11 says that Jesus then took the loaves and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. Now we know the story here of feeding the 5,000. But when there's a verse which says Jesus asked a question to Philip and Andrew, asking when he saw the crowd, hey, how are we going to feed them? Or how are we going to feed them? Do you think Jesus didn't know about it? But Philip went into the calculation piece of it, math. He got into how many days of wages is going to be this, how many denarii, how many dollars would be required to feed all of them. He went into that piece of it. And Andrew, on the other side, went into finding the available resources. And he came back with five loaves, barley loaves, and two fish. And he gave it to Jesus. Now here, rather than focusing on what they didn't have, Jesus thanked God for what they did have. You getting what I'm saying? Rather than focusing on what they didn't have, Jesus thanked God for what they did have. Now the word give thanks can be translated from a, from a Greek word which, which is eucharistio. Now this is a compound word which is a multiple words put together where eu means good and cherish means gift. Jesus recognized that even when what we have doesn't seem like much, it is still a good gift from God. Even if, even if what we have doesn't seem like much, it is still a good gift from God. Don't miss the opportunity to thank God for whatever you have. Don't miss the opportunity. Number two, is Jesus thank God for revealing his will. Now this portion is mentioned in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, and Luke chapter 10, verse 21. Now I like the way Luke has written, I like the way Luke has given an account of this. You know, in chapter in, in chapter 10, Jesus appoints 72 people and sends them out for a preaching and a teaching mission. Appoints 72 people and sends them out on a preaching and a teaching mission. They were not the 12 disciples. They were ordinary people, simple people like you and me. They were people who did not have a, probably a seminary degree or had not gone to a Bible college. They were simple, ordinary people. They were asked to go to every town, heal the sick, and tell them that the kingdom of God has come near. And guess what? They did it. In verse 17, it says they come back and tell Jesus, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And so Jesus offers up a prayer of thanksgiving to the Father when he hears the report of the 72 in verse 21. And the verse goes like this, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. What made Jesus rejoice here? When ordinary people did what they were told to do. Think about it. Wouldn't you love to know Jesus was rejoicing over something you did? 
Wouldn't it rock your world if you knew that Jesus was thanking God for you? Of course, yes. Then obey him. He makes his will known to us. Let's thank him for that. Be ready to do his will. And his will is to spread the gospel. His will is to end the gospel poverty in the world, in our nation, in our city. That's his will. You know, in the month of, in the month of September, we had the missions convention. And a couple of weeks later, we did the follow-up meeting on the same. And we spoke something about digital missions, digital missionaries. The world is heading towards technology. And I want to share in a, a small thing, a statistics that is there. You know, every day morning, we pastors, we share the daily devotions, Monday to Friday. We are a large church. And you know what? Those devotions don't even get 100 likes. Now hold on to your thoughts. I know where I'm taking this. Likes, really? Hold on. Not even 100 likes. Not even 30 comments. Not even 20 shares. Does that mean that every friend on your friend list is saved? Does that mean that everyone in your neighborhood knows Jesus? Does that mean that every colleague of yours is saved? If no, what are we doing about it? What are we doing about it? Oh, I, I don't want to be ashamed. You know, I don't want people to bracket me and saying that, you know, this is that guy doing something of that sort. It's fine. But it's not okay to be standing in front of the judgment throne and not have an answer. But why didn't you do it? I'm not saying that you got to share this, but you can do yourself too. There's a lot of things that can be done. There are still hundreds and thousands of people dying every day without knowing Jesus. And we are just being selfish, thinking about ourselves, coming into church, listening to the word, just being filled, worshiping and just going, not doing anything for the others. And I was talking to a friend of mine and he gave a very profound statement. He said, the harvest is online, but the laborers are offline. We the workers, we are all offline. Everybody is on the platform. Everybody is on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on Insta. Where are we? Oh, it's not for us? Really? Think about it. We still have a long way to go and a lot of work to be done for the Lord. We need to obey Him. He has made His will known to us. Let us thank Him for that. Number three, Jesus thanked God for hearing His prayer. John chapter 11 words, 38 until 44. Now this is the third time Jesus said thank you. And this is one of the most famous episodes from Jesus' life. It is when he raises Lazarus from the dead. Verse 41, it says, And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Jesus thanked God for hearing him. He then went on to make a beautiful and a great, amazing statement. And a statement of faith. In verse 42, he says, I know that you always hear me. Woo! I know that you always hear me. Now, is that just Jesus that has that assurance? Or all of us have that assurance? 
One of the amazing privileges of being a child of God is knowing that God hears our prayer. It's a privilege that we have. We know that God hears our prayer. Let us thank God that he hears our prayer. Jesus did that. Number four, and the last one. Jesus gave thanks at the most difficult time of his life. Mark 14, verse 17 until 26. Let's look at the last time Jesus gave thanks. And it is truly, it truly was the last time. It was the night before Jesus would be crucified. Jesus was in the upper room with his disciples for what would be his last meal. Verse 23 says, And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave to them, and they all drank of it. Did Jesus fully understand what was about to happen to him? Think about it. Did Jesus fully understand? Verse 18 says, And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. So not only was Jesus aware that he was about to be crucified, but he knew that one of the men had betrayed him. It must have been really, really difficult to sit on that table. And yet, Jesus was able to give thanks for the bread and the wine. How could he do that? I can think of two reasons. Number one, Jesus knew the end of the story. Jesus was aware of the joy that was set before him. He knew that Friday, which was the darkest day in the history, is coming. But after that, Sunday was coming. Sunday was coming. He knew. And we can trust that God has a plan for us as well. That he never fails us. His plans are always for His glory and our good. Let me say that again. His plans are always for His glory and our good. None of His promises fall onto the ground unfulfilled. None of His promises. And the second reason Jesus was able to give thanks on the most difficult day of His life was that He was in the habit of giving thanks every other day of his life. Can we fill our thankful tank full? Can we fill our tank of thanks and take it to the brim? When we give thanks to our, for our daily bread, when we give thanks to God, that God reveals his will to us, when we give thanks, to God for hearing our prayer, it becomes a mindset. And we are commanded to give thanks when it is easy so that we are able to give thanks when it is hard. Whether, church, whether this year has been a year of breakthrough or a breakdown, irrespective of a great year or an awful year. And as we, as we move on to engage and, and say thank you to the Lord, let us, let us say thank you. Let us say thank you to Lord our God for what he has done. Let us say thank you. God bless you. 
Thank you for taking time to listen. If you would like more information about our church or would like to make a comment, please mail us at info at newlifeag.in. God bless you.